So um, I want to st start in uh, with, a, with a small piece, a small standalone piece. Because I know you're all thinking to yourselves, I was wondering when that Melchizedek reading was going to come up. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, right, yeah, Melchizedek, buddies, right? Yeah, you're like, who in the world, what is this word? Particularly since it's in the New Testament, right? You think, well, this is an Old Testament word, and it is an Old Testament word. But it's kind of, what is this thing? So um, it's not really the core of the sermon, but I'll say a quick word about it that will be entirely unsatisfying, but it will help me feel better. So um, as, we, as we look at the reading, we hear about this priesthood of Melchizedek and the order of Melchizedek. This is going to take us back a little ways into the Old Testament. In fact, you might say almost all the way back as we talk about um, this priest king, Melchizedek, who was the king of a city, um, a mountain city on the coastal range on the eastern side of the Mediterranean. And um, Melchizedek uh, led the worship of the Most High God. And he is noted in the Old Testament as the one who comes out and blesses Abram. Now, this is before Abram has a whole name, like Abraham, and it's before Solemn, which we get kind of associated with the word shalom in the Semitic languages, which we traditionally translate as peace, but it also means wholeness. Uh, it's kind of got a broader meaning than just the word peace. But it's before the town Solemn has its whole name. Jerusalem um, is where this all comes to a point. And Mount Zion there, the peak that is under the Temple Mount, um, and is the core piece there. So the idea is that this is tying into a priesthood that predates even the priesthood, you might say. So there are the, the Levitical codes and the tribe of Levi that had responsibility for the temple operation as we think of it with Jesus kind of rolling into Jerusalem and going to the temple. The temple operation was run by the Levitical tradition, the tribe of Levi, father to son kind of priestly duties that would be different from this business of Melchizedek. That's all I'm saying on that. So feel free to look up more. Moving on. In the gospel text, uh, this also gives me a little bit of space to go in a different direction from where Elizabeth went with the text. I realized as she was giving her children's sermon at the first service that I was taking a slightly different angle here. We have James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder and lightning in some of the texts, um, brash guys that are coming up to Jesus, who the Greek is maybe a little ambiguous when they say, Jesus, we know that you are going to be huge, and we want to be your two key guys when you come in to your kingdom. And Jesus responds by saying, what would you ask of me? Now, the Greek is very polite. I think in some ways it might have been more like, who do you clowns think you are? <laughs> I'm sorry, was I asking for questions? I think there's, there's a lot of different ways that Jesus could have responded. Curiously, to Elizabeth's point, he does answer their questions, which I think is important because Jesus could have chose not to answer their questions. In the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are a bit of a clown car show. They, uh, they are always on the wrong foot, answering the questions wrongly. It's a bit of uh, just a mess with the disciples. So it is interesting that Jesus does show a little bit of reserve and does answer their questions ultimately. This idea of, can you drink from the cup that I will drink from? Can you be baptized? in the baptism with which I have been baptized. Now, curiously, bolder still, the two disciples say, sure, yeah, we can do that, which feels like you don't know entirely the scope of it. And Jesus suggests that then. The cup with which I drink is not a dinner reference. It is a reference to the cross. It is a bigger reference reference to understanding the following of Christ in that manner. But Jesus is offering something 
that is a reminder to us that God has come among us in Christ and is turning all of our human understandings of how the world works upside down. Upside down. So as we move through and move through these different phases, Jesus is ultimately moving towards a cross on a hill outside of Jerusalem where he will be executed by the state for treason. That is, by definition, losing. That is, by definition, the one who has lost by human understanding. Jesus is turning things on their head. In human circles, to have power and to be the victor is to have power over, power over others. Not to serve, but as the text says, to lord it over, right? We know how it's supposed to work, except repeatedly, Jesus is saying, I understand that's how you do it, but that's lame and wrong and not the way God wants you to live. Jesus is repeatedly hanging out with women, hanging out with outcasts, the sick and the lame, those at the edges of society who have no power or standing, jeopardizing his own reputation to say, I understand that you have these rules and the ways that you do things, but again, you're wrong. This is lame. This is how Jesus wants it to be. That those who have been brought low are lifted up. That the high and the mighty are brought down. Now, as you might imagine, the high and the mighty are not as big a fans of Jesus as he goes through his ministry. When we have the text that we have today, Jesus is focusing on this issue of service, an orientation outside ourselves towards others. Now, when I started in ministry, as many of you know, it was kind of exciting in that our son was born a month after we began, and there were all kinds of exciting medical issues that came up. Eli had a chance to drive in an ambulance in his first evening down to St. Cloud and then fly in a helicopter to Minneapolis Children's. Several days later, he had the first of his now to date seven open heart procedures. And usually how the routine would go once we got past that first month is that the cardiologist following him would say, you know, why don't we put a heart catheterization on the calendar and then with the idea that we're scouting out surgery for a few months down the road. And that pattern held up as we moved through his early years. Except one time we drove the two hours with Eli down for his heart cath, and they came out of the lab, it was a Tuesday, and they said, you know, there's a surgical slot open on Thursday. We think we should take it. Well, that was a shock. We didn't have extra clothes. We didn't have anything as far as that goes. But there was a social worker on the floor that we were on that really stood with us in the moment, a wonderful woman by the name of Ione. And Ione's husband was a Lutheran pastor in the Twin Cities. That was not my Senate. That was not my area. But she talked to her husband, Mark, and said, there's this young pastor and his family at the hospital, and it's been tough. You should come in and pray with them. And so early on Thursday morning, I remember it being dark outside still, Bishop Mark Hansen, some of you know that name. He was our presiding bishop in the ELCA up until recently. At the time, he was the bishop of the St. Paul Area Synod, came and prayed with us that morning. This sense of service that sometimes involves a 6 a.m. trip to the hospital to visit with a pastor who is not in your immediate sense of responsibility. But what struck me in the moment was something that would happen a couple years later when I bumped into him again with 40,000 people around us at the youth gathering. He came up to me and said, hey, you're Matt Smuts. You're at Shalom in Alexandria, right? I was like, <laughs> I was like, how in the world does this guy know my name? 
This was years before that that happened. It seemed inconceivable, this idea that he would know my name. Now, that's kind of a, a small thing in the whole scheme of things, but it reminds me of a show that I've been watching relentlessly over the last couple of months here. Pastor Frederica is tired of me talking about it. But some of you have seen the show Ted Lasso. There is a, a small thread in the first several episodes where one of the things that's special about him is that he knows everybody's name. And he makes a point to know the kit manager's name and the guy who mows the field to know his name. And they're all stunned because nobody bothers to know their names. Right? It's just that guy. This idea of service is turning this world on its head. It is orienting ourselves away from our natural orientation towards self, towards others. We often want to curve back. When we wake up in the morning, we're not concerned about our neighbor's breakfast. We're concerned about our breakfast, right? This idea that we are curved in towards ourselves. The value of joining together and being in community on a regular basis where we read lessons even about Melchizedek is an opportunity to anchor and ground ourselves and say, yes, that's right, I need to be oriented out. I need to be oriented towards others, this idea of service. There is an opportunity to be in the world in a way that puts others first. Others first. I've had a, a small example of this that's gotten under my skin over the last couple of years. I don't know if the pandemic made it work, but it's amazing to me that, that I would say 95% of automobiles in Northern California have had their, their turn signals disabled. Has anybody noticed this? <laughs> this idea that there is nobody outside of the four seats in my car that I need to think about at all, ever, for any purpose, right? But rather this idea that we need to be thinking outward. Now for traffic signals and stuff, it's good if everybody drives on the right side of the road, stops at stop signs, uses their signals. But I think what Jesus is talking about in the lesson today is that it's much, much, much bigger than that, including small things, but also vast things. When we think about service, we might think of special opportunities where we have the opportunity to do something special or perhaps we as individuals have certain skills or resources such that we're in a position to do something big. We read in history all the time about those who have served others in epic ways because of special circumstances that they happen to be in the middle of. But I am confident that 99% of the time, God is calling us to service simply because we are the right person at the right place at the right time. And I think the challenge for us is to have open hearts that allow us to take our agenda in that moment at work, at home, at school, as we walk across a parking lot, ready to set our agenda down for a half a minute when we see an opportunity to serve someone else. So I would encourage you as you think of this reading that the disciples have split amongst themselves into factions because they wanted to be first as this world describes first. But that Christ challenges us every week to confess to God the sin of being curved in on ourselves first, that we might open our hearts, turn towards others, that we might serve as Christ has served us. It may not be glamorous. You may not get extra credit for it. But Jesus doesn't promise that. 
Jesus promises peace in our hearts and that he will be near to us in our work. Amen.